2 Samuel 11, remember last week we had the uh, terrible story of, of David's um, rape of Bathsheba. And uh, this week we start with the aftermath of that, um, the, not just Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah, anyway, the aftermath, that terrible episode. And it's the visit of Nathan the prophet to David. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his meagre fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveller to the rich man and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Now then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to him, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have added a much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down your eye the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. If you have despised me and have taken the wife of your eye the Hittite to be your wife, thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. <clears throat> David said to Nathan, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. Oh, it's a terrible story and a disturbing tale, isn't it? Um, and it's, it's um, also an interesting example of how you need to hear a parable in context. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to trivialise it, but I think the uh, parable, that, the story that Nathan tells David is a good example of how... You need to hear stories in the Bible in their context. Can you imagine that story about the uh, people with the, uh, the one guy with the big herds and flocks and the other person with the one tiny lamb? How that story would be understood if you didn't understand the background. It would make no sense at all. Um, it makes sense because we understand the background. Likewise, with the parables of Jesus, I think it's very important that we understand the context in which they are given to make full sense of them. Now, Having said that, the, the focus here is on David, and the focus of the parable and of Nathan's attack is on David's murder of Uriah and taking Uriah's property, so it, it seems. And this reflects very much the place of women at the time. It doesn't focus on the violation of Bathsheba by David, but really um, the, and not even so much on the, on the um, David's sin against Uriah, let alone Bathsheba, but he sinned against God. And that's, um, that's really the focus. I have sinned against the Lord. You've despised the Lord, Nathan says. Why doesn't he say you, you despise Bathsheba, you despise Uriah, you despise the Lord? No, you, you've sinned against the Lord. And this is um, a reflection, I think, that um, ultimately you... you, you you damage people, it's, it hurts God. It's, it's God ultimately that, you, that you're dealing with here when, you, when you, you damage your sister 
your brother. Um, I think Tom Wright's right when he says, in the end, um, there's only one sin in the Hebrew Bible, and it's idolatry. It's forsaking God for the other gods. And this is exactly what you see, really, David's problem is idolatry. I mentioned last week that, um, you know, David's taking a Bathsheba and the whole situation with Uriah. We get the impression that David's trying to keep it all secret, but there's no way it would have been secret. David had a large household and everybody in that household and frankly, everybody in the neighborhood would have known exactly what was going on. And that's okay if you're an oriental despot. That was the way kings worked. Kings did what they wanted I mean, Samuel warned the people of Israel when they wanted a king. They said, you know, this is what your king's going to do to you. He's going to take your sons and your daughters and he's going to take your, your money and he's going to do what he pleases. And, and David is acting like the oriental despot. He sees the woman he wants her, he takes her. He wants someone killed, he has them killed. Uh, that's the way kings and leaders and people who aren't accountable to anybody else work. I mean, I won't make comparisons in our own day, but there seem to be any number of leaders in our own day who act unaccountably without um, uh, referring to the people they're supposed to serve. Uh, the point in this case is David is supposed to be serving God. You'll remember when uh, the original institution of kingship was established, uh, Samuel objected you know, you can't make someone else your king. God is your king. And he referred to Saul, the first king, as Nahuim, as prince. The Hebrew word, Nahuim. Prince, not king, Melech, you know, but prince. Um, the king of Israel was really supposed to be the prince under the kingship of God. And uh, that's what David is supposed to be. David is accountable. David thinks he can do as he pleases. I mean, after all, he's the king. He wants a woman, he takes her. He wants someone killed, he kills them. He's, a, he's the king. He does as he pleases. No. And Nathan comes and reminds him of his place. He's not the king. He's the prince. God is king. And you have despised God by usurping God's role as king of his people. And uh, this is why the focus of the parable, the focus of Nathan's judgment and the focus of David's lament later, I have sinned against the Lord, against the only have I sinned, he will say. The focus is on his idolatry. He hasn't recognised who is really in charge. I mean, this is not to minimise the pain and the horror of his actions towards Bathsheba, towards Uriah, but ultimately, ultimately, his fundamental sin he's forgotten. Who is God? We'll have our second reading. It's from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, a, a favourite of mine. Where in chapter 4, the first 16 verses, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made cap captivity itself a captive, and he gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what it means is he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same as the one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful schemings, but speaking the truth in love, 
we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament which is which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Isn't it a, a beautiful passage, a wonderful hymn of praise and a wonderful vision on the part of the Apostle Paul of, of the church working unity like, like one body, like one great beautiful body working together, everybody participating in harmony with one another. <laughs> oh, how, how distant that, how, it, it doesn't, it's not like that, is that? I mean, think of the church today fragmented and broken and bickering and um, unity. I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Cause I don't know whether the church has ever been so divided, but I certainly look at our Australian community here at the moment and I've never seen the Australian community so divided. Um, I appreciate some people will feel the division from me at the moment because of my participation in the anti-lockdown protests last week and because of my, the stance I've taken in uh, support of individual freedoms. Um, and I appreciate that for other people feel this is threatening their health and, and uh, threatening the situation of the... the uh, threatening to maintain the very lockdowns which which so many of us oppose. I mean, I've given my reasons for why I feel the way I do and particularly given some of the people I'm working with who are, who are um, it, it really at risk, including the uh, friend who was with me this morning and just, just left here. Um, the point is, though, that there's been... Uh, there's people are terribly divided at the moment, and that's understandable. We, we we have disagreements with each other over the way forward, over what should be being done. On people feel threatened, people feel fearful, and um, fear is a terrible thing for dividing people. There was division. People had different beliefs and different opinions in uh, the church. Paul was addressing too, of course. Very different. He's speaking to people, particularly the, across the Jewish-Gentile divide, with very different backgrounds, very different understandings, uh, very different uh, visions as to the way forward. I mean, people very divided. The one Jesus addressed too, particularly in terms of the way forward, most of them felt the way forward was, was violent revolution. And uh, Jesus and Paul, likewise, resisted that. But there's a recognition there that there's enormous diversity, difference of belief um, within the body. And Paul says that, you know, we'll move beyond that eventually. Uh, speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head. So we don't, we don't not talk about things we disagree about. We, we talk about them in love. We speak the truth in love. And together, through doing that, we, we grow up. We reach this point where um, we become one body, beautifully knit together in, in, in love. And, and that process, Paul says, involves everybody who has gifts, using those gifts for the building up of the body. And he says, uh, you know, God's given some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, and interestingly, their role is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So, interesting from a, um, a clerical point of view, the role of the uh, prophet, priest, apostle, evangelist, etc., or the role of, if you like, the priest, the bishop, etc., is not to do the ministry, it's to equip the saints for the work of ministry, it's to help everybody get on with the ministry. In other words, those of us who have a teaching role or a pastoring role, we play our role for the sake of the broader body of the community to help them uh, do the real work. So um, those of us who have been given uh, more explicit roles as priests or, or prophets or teachers or, or something else, we do our bit to help 
the group, the community as a whole, um, move forward. It's, it's not us who are supposed to be <laughs> doing all the ministry. We do it. We all do it together. Uh, and prophets, priests, pastors, apostles, etc. They have a, a particular role in that, but it's not their work. It's everybody's work. Um, and through that work, through our con uh, mutual contributions to the body, we grow up and ultimately, as Paul sees, we move beyond the divisions, perhaps even beyond the disagreements. But uh, I think even with the disagreements, we move towards a point of unity built on mutual love and mutual respect through Christ who is the glue who holds us together and the head of the body. We'll stand for the gospel. Holy Gospel is written in the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the 24th verse. Glory to you. Lord Jesus Christ. The next day the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not gone into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, we, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Well, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What works are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. It is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we're in John's Gospel in what is the um, going to be a first of a series of um, readings where Jesus speaks about the bread of life. And, um, you know, I think at one level it's it's um, reminiscent of some of the other dialogues we've seen Jesus having with people like Nicodemus, like the woman at the well, where there's a dialogue going on on two levels. If you with Jesus, with Nicodemus rather, Jesus was talking about um, being born again and or born from above and the wind and the spirit and, and Nicodemus keeps thinking he's talking about real physical birth and, and um, it, it, Jesus is speaking on another level. Likewise with the woman, he speaks about living, flowing water and she thinks he's speaking about, you know, an underground well somewhere, the spring that, that um, you know, she's thinking on a, a more mechanical, physical level and Jesus again is speaking of metaphor, the, the mysterious work of the Spirit of God. Uh, here, likewise, there's a discussion going on about bread and um, the people who th think he's talking in terms of uh, the miraculous feeding, oh, there's more bread going, you know, um, 
the special bread. Give us this bread. And of course, Jesus is, is again speaking metaphorically, and the bread he's is speaking about is, is his body. He's now speaking about himself. Uh, this is the uh, one of these uh, very important I am statements, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We, we've had one other I am statement before with the woman at the well, I am he. Uh, is, you get this uh, in Greek, ego amy, very important because it, it echoes the um, the uh, language of God to Moses at the burning bush, I am who I am or I will be who I will be, I am, God says. And Jesus likewise says a number of times, particularly recorded in John's Gospel, I am, ego amy, um, to the woman at the world and, and here I am the bread of life. Um, so this is this is a uh, story about Jesus, and this and the whole uh, dialogue is going to tell us something about Jesus. It's also again a story about how people misunderstand Jesus, and I, I think it's uh, forgive me for introducing a a word that I don't even know how to pronounce properly, but in, in my old philosophical days Fragestellung I think <laughs> my, my brother who's a German teacher would probably tell me that's the wrong pronunciation it's probably Fragestellung or something else but uh, the German concept of the, the, the putting of the question is how it is the, 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 the answer you get all depends on the questions you ask and how you ask those questions um, a wise person once said to me, look, you know, what you see depends on what you're looking at and what you hear depends on who you're listening to. And the answers you get depend on the questions you ask. And this is the issue here as Jesus dialogues with people as elsewhere where he dialogues with people. The problem is not the answers he's giving, which they can't comprehend. The problem is the questions they're coming with. They're asking the wrong questions or they're asking them in the wrong way. And so they're not getting the answers they're looking for. How did you get here, they, they, they say to Jesus. Uh, you know, they <laughs> didn't see him, his boat. You know, they're, they're fascinated. And, and Jesus says, you're here for another feed. Um, you didn't see the signs. You, you had your fill of the loaves. That was supposed to point to something else. It should lead you to look up and, and to focus elsewhere, but you're still thinking about your belly, perhaps, or your focus is on the wrong place, and hence you're asking the wrong questions and you're asking them in the wrong way. And I think this is the at the core of the um, tension between Jesus and the, the people he's dealing with here in John chapter 6 and in the ongoing um, parts of, of this dialogue. Um, they've come to Jesus with the wrong questions. And I think this is so often the case for us. If we come to Jesus looking for how to get a bigger bank balance and a better sex life and, a, you know, how to solve the problem of our mortgage and, and things like this, we're probably not going to get the answers. Uh, we're looking, we're probably not going to get any answers. Or, you know, We've got to come to Jesus with with the right questions, and this is the, this is the uh, the heart of the problem here. What do they ask him? What do we need to do? They say, you know, what what are the works of God? What what work do we need to perform to do the works of God? Um, Jesus says, believe in the one He sent. You know, again, there's um, the the focus is wrong. They're looking for a simple uh, way forward. You know, the popularity of all those articles you read online, which will tell you seven ways to get rid of your belly fat or six easy steps to um, solve your mortgage problems or whatever it is. We, we love just little straightforward explanations of, you know, what do we need to do? Well, it's very simple. You just say this prayer and um, you know, everything will turn out fine. You know, and looking for something. What do we need to do? Jesus says, believe in the one God sent. In other words, maybe it, it's not about what you need to do, do. It's about what God is doing and about what Jesus is doing and about who Jesus is. And this is where their focus needs to be. You know, I, I think in our contemporary situation, again, 
This is a, a powerful reminder. What do we need to do? you know, in, in Australia, in Sydney at the moment, to get out of lockdown, to get out of all this, this terrible virus situation. What, 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 give us some straightforward steps and the rest of it. And, you know, perhaps we need to look up. Perhaps there is no simple, you know, four-step solution. In this dialogue in John 6, the issue is not what we need to do, but take a look at what God is doing. Take a look at what God is doing. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. What's that beautiful concluding verse? Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Instead of focusing on, you know, what, what steps we need to be, be taking and do we need to work harder and walk down more or do this more or that more, look up for a moment. Jesus says he is the answer we've been looking for. I am the bread of life. It's hard sometimes. We, we, we want to know what do we need to do. Give us some simple steps. And as, uh, sometimes the answer is don't just do something, stand there. Sometimes we just need to stop look up see what god is doing i guess in these difficult days that's what i'm looking at now what is god doing jesus jesus is the bread of life he, the one who comes to him will, will not be hungry will not be thirsty we need to look to jesus to find out not simply what we need to do but what god is doing and we do so in faith that God knows our needs and is ready to meet our needs. Thanks be to God.